Hey there guys, all right, today we are back with some more geography now, and this time we're on a Sao Tome and Principe. Um, and well, we, uh, after this week, uh, after this uh, episode of geography now, we are into the territory of the episodes where they start averaging around closer to 30 minutes, <laughs> starting with Saudi Arabia. But this week's Sao Tome. Uh, before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I'd love if you join the Discord and follow me over at Twitch, and please do go check out the gaming channel here on YouTube. With all that said, let's go ahead and dive into a very small country that speaks Portuguese, I believe. Yes. All right, Saltome and Principe, or St. Thomas and Prince. This country often ranks as Africa's number one or two least known and visited country. Only like huh. Portuguese people know about this place, and like half the time it gets mistaken for Cape Verde. Eh, what can I say? I'm kind of sexy. Yeah, you guys do have some good looking people, not gonna lie. But anyway, Saltome and Principe, let's do this. <laughs> It's time to learn geography now! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbs. This country is small and practically unknown, which means I had a lot more fun researching and talking to you guys, the geography peeps from this country while I was writing the script. By the way, as you know, this video was shot during COVID-19 pandemic era times, so everything is shot in my office. Caleb and Jillian are my tenants. They live in my house, so obviously they can be in these videos. Art lives within walking distance. He's super close, so he's gonna be a regular. And we are limiting our guest hosts to one a week and and this week it is Mr. Keith. What's up? Keith, do the disclaimer. Hey guys, just so you know, we take all the necessary precautions when it comes to traveling. Got the face mask. And each of the segments are filled in separate time slots. So, you know. So we're not filming in a group all at once. Oh, by the way, Keith, uh, what are you wearing? I am wearing this fantastic Keith shirt that you can get at the geographynow.com uh, web store. Do you want to wear my face on your sexy body? Well, go ahead. <laughs> Who wouldn't want that? Thanks, Keith. All right, in the meantime, let's find this country on the globe, shall we? Bum, bum, bum. Jeez, I can't believe I'm wearing this shirt again. It was when was the last time I wore this in an episode. Anyway. Context. Interesting fact. These islands were actually completely uninhabited when they were discovered by the Portuguese. They arrived on December 21st, oh. or St. Thomas Day. Hence, forthwith, they named it after the Apostle St. Thomas. The dude who doubted Jesus and said, I will not believe until I see. And that's kind of been like the theme of Sao and Principe's approach to the world. You have to come and see to believe. Mostly because they have this really freakishly cool looking volcanic plug thing. But we'll talk about that later in this episode. First of all, the country is located in the Gulf of Guinea, or more specifically, the Bight of Bonnie, the inlet in the Atlantic Ocean where what West Africa curves downward into Central Africa. The country is made up of two main islands, Saltome, the larger one, with about 86% of the land mass and 96% of the population, and the smaller Principe Island, which is actually an autonomous region within the country that self-governs itself with its own assembly. Amidst these two main islands are groups of smaller satellite islets and rocks, such as Rolas and Cabras off of Saltome, as well as the Tinosa Islands, Corozo, and Bombom in the north, by Principe. Mm -hmm. Their maritime boundaries extend outwards with other neighboring countries. However, in the north, they have a joint development zone with Nigeria. The country is divided into seven districts, six on Sao Tome Island, and the entire island of Principe is within itself the last district, called Page. The capital is named just like the country, Sao Tome, which holds about a quarter of the entire population. After that, Santo Amaro and Neves come in as the second and third largest towns. The country's largest and only international airport, Sao Tome International, is located on the north side of Sao Tome Island, and only three countries have flight services to Sao Tome, Portugal, Angola, and Cape Verde. Otherwise, mm. to get in between the two main islands... Well, that would explain why it is so unknown. You gotta go to Portugal first before getting to Sao Tome. That's just, you know, a lot of work. <laughs> this country, you have two options, flight or ferry. Flights operate three to five times a week, depending on the season, between Sao Tome International and Principe Airport, the only other airport of the country. The flight takes about 45 minutes and lands on a short airstrip that can only accommodate 18-seater twin turboprop aircrafts from the national airline Africa's Connection STP. Otherwise, with ferries, things are a little more complex. There is irregular passenger ferry services between the island's largest ports, the port of Anachavis Bay, where the military and cargo ships dock as well, and Santa 
Santo Antonio port on Principe. The trip lasts anywhere between 8 to 12 hours and bookings must be made at the offices in person. Fun fact, Sao Tome is actually one of the few places on Earth where you can actually touch the equator. In order to do it though, huh. you will have to take a ferry from Porto Alegre in the south to Rolas Island and hike through the forests where there is a mosaic map with a massive place marker monument. Yeah, that equator monument. If you decide to visit, don't make this mistake. Whoa, after 28 hours, I'm finally in Sao Tome. Sao, Sao Tome. I heard I could find this equator thing. It looks like a big line on the world. It's in the south. Finally, I'm in Porto Alegre. Where is that equator? It's on that small island. You gotta take a ferry to get there. Fine. Okay, seriously, where is this equator thing? Esta es la isla de Anabon. Fuiste demasiado lejos. Ah, f but what it's worth though, if you are really intrepid and want to do something that very few people have done, Sao Tome is probably the best place to depart if you want to try and get to the Null Island buoy. A single lone buoy that sits in international waters, marking the coordinates of where the prime meridian meets the equator, or in short, zero degrees longitude and latitude, or the center of the earth. Oh well, actually, that's inaccurate. There is no center of the earth unless we're talking about the spherical center, and furthermore- Yeah, 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 shut the f up, nerd. In any case, if you decide to visit, yeah. here are some of the top spots you should probably check out. San Sebastian 4. The National Museum, the Santa Catarina Tunnel, mm. the Cacao Culture Center, Claudio Corallo Chocolate Plantation, mm -hmm. the Old Market, the Almada Negrerios Museum House, Bom Bom Island Resort, Club Santana, Boca do Inferno. And one thing you'll see all over are these historical massive plantation estates known as Rosas or Rosas. You know, sometimes in Portuguese the R makes an H sound. I don't know why you guys do that. Many of them are either in ruins or repurposed for homes and businesses. On Principe Island is kind of where that eclipse happened and then that dude like proved the theory of relativity in 1919. So yeah, Einstein's theory wouldn't mean jack squat if it wasn't for Sao Tome. Moving on. Now, one of the biggest sources of pride and glory for Sao Tome and Principe would have to be its land makeup. Even though they are the second smallest country in Africa in land area, there's a lot going on concentrated in less than 400 square miles, a thousand square kilometers. For one, Sao Tome and Principe lies on a geological fault line known as the Cameroon Line, an unusual volcanic rift system about 1,600 kilometers or 900 miles long that extends from the ocean diagonally into the mainland of the African continent. This rift extends even further inland to the Central African Shear Zone that goes across the entire continent, ending near the Red Sea in Sudan, effectively meaning that Africa has a huge horizontal split line that nobody talks about. Back hmm. to the country though, they are sandwiched right in between Malabo, the first island, and Anabon, the last of the Cameroon Line islands, both of which belong to Equatorial Guinea. These islands are essentially the peaks of underwater shield volcanoes that start about 3,000 meters below sea level and today are extinct. This also means the entire island of Sao Tome has a central mountain zone of lush jungles, the tallest peak being Pico Sao Tome in the center west side of the country. From these hills flow an abundance of rivers and creeks on all That's sides, a lot of rivers. the longest river of the country being the Rio Il Grande that flows to the southeast. The country doesn't really have any major inland bodies of water or lakes. I asked you guys, the geography peoples from this country, and a few of you said maybe Lake Amelia, but it's more like a marshy swamp. Anyway, the climate mm. is warm and humid, averaging around 80 degrees or 27 degrees Celsius. Even though they are Dude, small, their rough topography me. actually creates a I'm microclimate a between the north and south of Sao Tome Island. The south Westerly winds carry more moisture, as in up to 275 inches of rain in the south, but the mountains block the north areas, which only get on average less than 30 inches of rain annually, creating oh, a more arid landscape. Finally, due to their position outside of the open Atlantic jet streams, they are pretty safe from storms and have less than a 1% chance of being hit by damaging cyclone winds. Yeah, the volcanic activity is pretty much what created their most iconic landmark, Pico Cal Grande. Cal it's a with penis. The swizzle thing. Oh yeah, I have to pretend I'm a drunk Russian speaking Spanish. That was actually probably better. Or Great Dog Peak. Located in the south of Sao Tome Island, this massive needle-shaped monolith is made from solidified magma. It rises sharply at about 1,200 feet from the jungle floor below. Here's a great video from How YouTuber Jacob born? Kuferman. Check it out. It's absolutely breathtaking. Anywho, it's time for my triple shot of espresso break from a, you know, Geography Now mug that you can get at geographynow.com. Which means it's time for Noah. However, he's filming off-site, so uh, let's uh, call him in. Beep, beep. Noah, you there? So let's get to it, shall we? With Sao Tome and Principe land you- Why is- why is- why is Noah's stuff more, uh, more HD? 
Gifts in nature are taken pretty seriously. For one, about half of the land is used in agriculture and about 30% is forested. The main product of the country boasts in production? Cocoa. The crop known for being high in quality has been grown for centuries and in itself makes up almost 70% of their exports. In addition, nearly a third of the country is involved in the fishing industry. Fish make up about 80-85% to of the protein source for the people of the nation, one of the highest ratios in Africa. Fish stocks have been dropping recently though due to foreign fishing vessels buying their rights to fish Ew. in their waters. Much Porn. of the remaining food, though, is imported as it's actually... That could be taken out of context. I... Foreign companies, bad. <laughs> ...cheaper than depending on local production. The sad well, thing... The, not all foreign companies are bad. Is uh, uh, I'm gonna shut up. ...is after independence, Sao Tome and Prince Bay have tried almost every trick in the book for economic redevelopment, but it just never seemed to work. It was like, all right, we just got independence. I mean, things are a little bit rusty. I'll admit that, but hey, the IMF is giving us aid. I'm devaluing my currency. Uh, okay, what else? I'm doing all this exciting stuff, like reducing my budget deficit, privatizing formerly nationalized companies, and I'm removing price subsidies. What do you think? That's, that's good, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, good job. So you want to like come over, maybe get involved, maybe invest a little bit in our country? Eh, you guys have a really long wet season and it's kind of expensive to travel to your country. Oh, hey, look, Ghana has some really good chocolate. What the f man? My chocolate is better. Hey, come here, get over here. You're gonna eat my chocolate. Yeah, it's weird. They did everything oh, yeah. right and yet still nothing seemed to budge on the international scale. For a while, there was even hope that the country might have potential in the oil and petroleum industry as some oil was discovered in 2006. Unfortunately, the reserve was deemed too deep and with insufficient quality. My lips are getting a bit dry. All right. Instead, today, the people and government are trying to take an economic shift more in the direction of ecotourism, as the island is loaded with spectacular nature. And speaking of nature, here's our animal correspondent, Gary Harlow. Actually, uh, Caleb's not here to be Gary Harlow. He's actually working for Nickipedia. Yeah, Nick and I kind of toss Caleb around every so often. He's that good. He's in high demand. So, uh, someone's gonna have to fill in. I guess it's gonna be you, Keith. Oh my god. Animals and stuff? Uh, yeah. You, have you ever talked about animals? Oh, uh, I, I mean, I, I had a goldfish one time. Close enough. All right. All right, you need a hat? Um, all I have is this thing from Oman. Oh my god. <laughs> In Sao Tome and Principe. All right, don't do the accent. In Sao Tome and Principe. Oh, do the accent. Gary Harlow here. He'd be proud. I don't know where else to go. Okay. The only endemic mammal is the what Sao the fuck is that Tome thing? shrew. Otherwise, you'll find Mona monkeys that were introduced from the mainland. Oh, the, the, the country is more heavily populated by birds, reptiles, and, you guessed it, amphibians. You got these six endemic frog species, and one species is highly elusive Sicilian. The cobra boo-boo. Bobo. <laughs> Cobra Bobo. Sicilians, not to be confused with Sicilian, <laughs> are classified as amphibians. And they're strange creatures. Some have razor sharp teeth. Nope. And in infancy, the babies eat nope. the dead skin of their mothers. Nope. As nourishment. Charming! Their national animals, that looks though, like my nightmare. Which seen on the coat of arms, are the red footed falcon and the endangered African gray parrot. Fun fact I actually have a pet African gray back in Florida. Do you really? I do. Whoa, dang. They're like endangered, so I got one. That's probably illegal, man. I don't think it is. I mean, I <laughs> thank you, Gary. And with that, it's time to finish off this segment as we always do food. As mentioned, Sao Tome and Principe is a heavy fish consuming country. You'll notice a lot of Portuguese influence in their cuisine. The most popular fish would probably be the red grouper, the sea bass, and flying fish, which are sold everywhere. Some of the top dishes you guys suggest we mention include Riga de Peixe, Feijao a Moda de Terra, chicken with coffee sauce, matabala <laughs> with octopus sauce, Isakente, and Moqueca, Asucarina, and the national dish, called Lulu. All right, that's it. Not a big fish guy, and this is a small country, so that that amount of time for the uh, food segment, I shall give a pass. Um, but yeah, fish, not my kind of thing. Yeah, do I even like fish? I think I can't remember the last time I had fish. I mean, I like shrimp. I like um seafood. That's really it. <laughs> That's what I got for you. Shot off site at my humble abode. Back to you, Barbs. Thanks, Noah. Oh, and it's also important to note that when fish is not available, the people here actually kind of prefer pork as a secondary option for their protein. So when they ask for it, they probably say, give that sow to me. <laughs> 
Any, <laughs> you can't have a country without people that make the country. So let's find out how the people have made it, shall we? Brum, brum, brum. First of all, the people from here are called Saltomeans or Santomeans and Principeans. Now, Saltome is our last and smallest Lusophone country here on Geography Now. Lusa what? Lusophone. It means Portuguese speaking. Ah. Anyway, the country has about 212,000 people and is the second smallest African country in population after Seychelles, and about half the population is under 15 years oh, old. Oh shit. It's hard to get exact numbers as most people just identify as Santomeans without specifying too much in their background, but generally it's estimated that somewhere around 70% of the country are African black, and the next largest group are Mestizo, or mixed race, mostly with black and European, sometimes called Bobo, at around 29%. The remaining 1% or so are mostly Europeans, mostly Portuguese, and a few Asians mixed in as well. Although keep in mind, many of these people might be investors that have residency, but do not live full time in the country. The country uses the Dobra as their currency. They use a type C and F plug outlets and they drive on the right side. Damn right they do. The correct side of the road. Fuck you, Britain. Side of the road. Now, as mentioned, Satomi speaks Portuguese. However, they do have their own distinct Creoles. Furthermore, if you don't speak Portuguese, you actually might be able to get by with French. It's what? taught in schools, and they do a lot of business with the neighboring French-speaking countries ah, of Africa. Now, if you ask a Santomean what they are, most of them will probably just say they are Santomean, and they really don't think twice about any further classification. But technically, Santomeans are all descended from seven different types of people groups. The country started out primarily Angolares, or slaves, that were brought over from Angola. And eventually, the Angolares were freed, and then they and their children were called foros, or freed men in Portuguese. In the midst of all this, the Luso-Africans, or mixed-race biracial inhabitants between the Portuguese and Africans, were around and had the privilege of being born into freedom and often held positions in running the country. After slavery was abolished, the Portuguese brought in the servicais, or the contract laborers, that were brought over from Angola, Mozambique, and Cape Verde, that were only supposed to live temporarily, but some ended up staying, and and the children of the Servicais were called the Tongas. Some of the Servicais from Angola created their own community known as the New Angolares, not to be confused with the original Angolares that were brought over centuries prior during slavery years. They have their own distinct dialect and custom. And finally, that means the last group are Europeans, mostly Portuguese, and Asians, mostly Mecanese Chinese. Today, though, nobody uses those words. The only words they use are Foros for Santomeans and Monco for Principeans. There's that town in the south, São João dos Angolares, where the the Angolar people live, but they only make up like 33% of the population. But otherwise, it's basically, everybody's basically Foro or Monko. Anyway, faith-wise, about 55% of the country adheres to Catholicism, and the next largest groups are mostly Protestant-based Christian denominations. And finally, they are a conscription country. Military service can begin as early as age 17. The thing, though, hmm. is with Satomi and Principe, you get a lot of, like, African folklore and tradition fused in with Portuguese influence. And to further explain, usually Hannah comes in, but she was in the last episode so we need someone to substitute which means today it's gonna be art it's me Natsuvenia. <laughs> over the years the people of <laughs> this is not working <laughs> over the years the people of Sao Tome and Principe have had kind of to develop their own distinct identity and technically nobody was native over time their ancestors kind of fused old customs from the mainland with a dash of Portuguese vibrance San Tome and geography Anna says we are a very superstitious country we have stories of witches who are able to shapeshift we believe in making people sick or making them fall in love with witchcraft we call it by R and Gugu's if you don't know what a Gugu is it's a a little creature that grants wishes. Like Tarchin, he grants wishes too. For one, about a third of the population is rural, and you'll notice a lot of them lived in dispersed settlements, known as Luchans. The kinship system is often seen as bilateral. Although traditionally men have often been polygynous and may have multiple children with multiple women, they have customary visiting relationships. This means about a third of the households are headed by females. In addition, Sao Tome and Principe is a very theatrical nation. They love telling stories through live performances that they have been doing for centuries. The two most common ones are Chiloli, which is a tragedy story of Emperor Charlemagne, as well as Danso oh. Congo, which tells the story of a Congolese king that was brought into slavery. You have the Auto de Felipe's or San Lorenzo on August 10th on Principe Island, in which the whole population takes part in a reenactment of the European and Moorish battles of Africa. Sounds super exciting. Right, Tarchin? Of course, during these public holidays and festivals, there is what? There's a lot of music. Who hosts the music? We're going back to Keith, Florida man Keith. Let's do it. Boom. Whee! 
The music in Satome and Principe is like a mix of European and African joined together into one. Satomeans have a multitude of rhythms that they jam to, like these. However, mm. Principe is home to the day sabi. I can understand why people listen to it. It is said that Paul. Polish. It is said that the Polish d danced African rhythms <laughs> in the middle of the night to help them sleep. <laughs> it is said that Portuguese ballroom dancing may have influenced the development of these styles. And then we have some other styles like these. Things I don't know how to pronounce, but Kizomba is like super popular, I guess. In fact, Kiduro in Kizomba, which originated originally in Angola, <laughs> is an offshoot of Zook music <laughs> and widely adored here. I'll just keep that. <laughs> All right. It is widely spread amongst the Palo or Portuguese speaking African countries. They love this stuff. It's all over the place. Many will say that the godfathers of Sao Tome and music though would have to be the band Leoninos founded in 1959. The music was even banned from Portuguese radio as their songs criticized colonialism. And finally another popular native genre, Bulawe. It's an upbeat tone. It's got some good grooves, you know, good songs to dance to some jams. Thank you, Keith. How would you like to leave this segment? I don't know. Maybe my head should explode or something. I don't know. You know, that'd be kind of... So now it is time for the briefly condensed history segment in the quickest way I can condense it. These guys basically discovered the islands in 1469. The first settlement was established. Principe gets its first settlement. Slave trade begins. Yay. The legend of the Angolaris slave ship shipwreck. Portuguese convicts are sent to the island and encouraged to intermarry with slaves. Royal charter allows mixed race Santomans to hold government positions. The Maroon slave rebellions. Weird time when they were raided by the French pirates. The Dutch came in and took over for like seven years. What? Slavery abolished, but Portugal still used a weird forced contract payment labor system. Movement for liberation of Sao Tome and Principe was established. Batepa massacre. Independence from Portugal. Democratic reforms in 1990 led to fair free elections. Outside investors considered development, but the process is still in progress. And here we are today. Some of the top famous with the size of this country and really its relative popularity, I think that was a pretty good history segment. Yeah. People you guys, the Santo Man geography people suggested we mention in this episode include King Amador, Alda Espirito Santos, Ketson Fernandez. Wait a minute, I feel like I've heard that name before. No, I don't think I have. Pinto Santos, Ketson Fernandez, Manuel Pinto da Costa, Carlo Mendes, Pascual Viegas, Almara Negrerios, Viana da Mota, Palema, Camilo Domingos, Saldeos Lima, Juca, João Carlos. Yeah, small island, but uh, they got some people that have made strides across the world, kind of. And speaking of the way how they interact with the world, that brings us to the last segment. <laughs> Sao Tome and Principe is small, but never alone. They're kind of like the little brother that tags along for all the family events. And they're like at the very end of the family pictures. They keep tight with their fellow Lusophone countries, but those aren't the only countries that interact with them. For one, their mainland Francophone neighbors, Gabon, Cameroon, and the Republic of Congo are some of the biggest business partners. Gabon is also one of the only few countries with direct flights to Sao Tome. This is also partially why French is the second language of Sao Tome and Principe, as it is commonly used for interaction with countries like these. India was one of their first friends since independence and puts a lot of money invested in their development of technology and agriculture sectors and cooperation has been pretty good since the beginning. They used to have diplomatic relations with Taiwan but in 2013 they dropped and switched it up to the People's Republic of China whom now has invested heavily in certain infrastructure projects. Mm. Otherwise back to the Lusophones, Brazil is like the big shot sibling that they admire and watch from a distance. They love his TV shows and movies and Cape Verde is kind of like the cool cousin too that visits often as they are close closer and has a lot of stories because he has a lot of people in diaspora in other countries like the USA and Portugal. When it comes to their best friends, however, most people I have talked to have said probably Portugal and Angola. Angola is the main provider of gas and oil. They have a ton of Angolans that either visit or migrate and live there. There's even an Angolar community and Angolans are easily welcomed in the country. With Portugal, even after colonial years and independence, the two have still maintained close ties. Portugal is the biggest investor and business partner and much of Sao Tome and Principe's economy 
economy depends on them. Portugal's military also has an agreement to help with patrolling and protecting them, especially from Gulf of Guinea pirates. The Portuguese ship NRP Zaire is stationed there and is responsible for helping out with things like military training and so on. In the end, they all have a strong alliance. In conclusion, there is kind of like a sense of magic with Sao Tome and Principe. Just like their name, they are kind of like the unknown prince of the chocolate islands with a magical unicorn horn powered by the equator. Just visit. Stay tuned. The big guy, Saudi Arabia, is coming up next. And that was Geography Now, Satome and Principe. Uh, this was a weird episode. It didn't really feel like they <laughs> were all that focused. It might be due to COVID lockdown times, uh, just making the brain go cuckoo. Um, so I'm not going to hold it down with them in any way. Um, it was a weird episode. It felt just like, I don't know. It was just kind of ADHD a bit, I would say. I think is the best <laughs> way I can explain it. It just kind of felt a little all over the place. Uh, not as not as focused um, from the presenters um, as usual. But not bad. Uh, I mean, they did a pretty good history segment, I would say, for this country. Um, without all that said and done, I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.